Renee Hemerson. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. I am really looking forward to having you at the conference in March. But before then, we wanted to just take a few moments, um, get to know you and the awesome work that you have been doing. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Bethany. Looking forward to seeing you in person, in person as well in March. Yes. And it it will be in person. It'll be awesome. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for, yeah, thank you for this opportunity to, to, to talk um, before that and to get to know a little bit more um, about uh, what, were you, what were you doing at Roche. Wonderful. Okay. So I know that Roche is moving from these formal fixed roles and structures to more of these flexible structures. Why is building collaborative network capabilities such a key pillar of success in this transformation? Well, because the world is complex and the more um, the more we see we operate we operate in a business that um, aim to deliver better benefits to patients, um, more medical advances in and uh, reduce our goal is also to do that three to five times more and reduce the cost society by half. It's a, it's a risky business that um, um, not always um, would succeed and bring those innovations to the market. Um, but it's, it's a needed risk because it's on, the only way we can um, innovate is to take uh, some of those calculated risks. So fixed structures or fixed setups are not very well consent to people taking those risks or for us to take those, to, uh, take those risks on bring innovation to patients. The best would be that we are able then to, be, to have a more fluid structure where um, people then can identify opportunities or innovate um, in a um, faster pace. And, and uh, when things we learn that something doesn't work, we can then shift it to something else. So traditionally speaking, an organization that has that operates in the healthcare, if a therapeutic area of, um, has a good portfolio, um, uh, they keep a certain num number of people, and as they are trying to develop new products and new therapeutics, then they bring new people. But if that new product or those therapeutics do not work, what traditionally they do is they get rid of people. But these are all people that have very good um, expertise. They're very talented professionals and they have very um, a lot of transferable skills. So it's a way to create, um, creating this collaborative network I call as an adaptable organization is to enable people to bring those transferable skills, expertise to other areas. And it's also a way to cross pollinate those, um, those silos and then come with even better and uh, faster innovation for our patients. Wow, that's really interesting. I hear you hitting on these themes of adaptability, agility, being able to go to market faster and then shift or pivot quickly when you need to, um, to reach that success. That's right. Yeah. It's a very good so summary. <laughs> so what has been the key then to building these like scalable and resilient networks across boundaries, across borders? And why did you prioritize doing that first? Hmm. Okay, so the way we see is um, it's more as an emergent solution. But say the first thing we did is try to understand what are the state of collaboration we had across the organization. Okay. So we know that to create um, innovative solutions, um, it's a collaborative effort. It's not an individual that is uh, alone doing a little piece of work. It's actually a collaborative work inside the organization across teams, but also outside the company. Um, so then what is the state of collaboration we had? So once, once we learned that, we identified um, individuals that are extremely very good on doing that, on collaborating across boundaries, what we call the boundary spanners, or uh, the central collaboration in certain clusters. 
So the points of reference where everyone go to, to get inspiration or ideas. And there are people that are just uh, energized, they just created the energy across teams. And when, when uh, challenges come, or because these are difficult projects sometimes, these are the people that really um, make people, uh, remind people of the purpose, why they are doing that and energize their work. So we then learn from them. Uh, what are the secrets of their success? What are the practices they use? What are the behaviors they adopt? And what were in their way of um, working? And we heard a very consistent story, you know, like that uh, um, they are able to operate very well across the organization, but there are some structures and some processes, most of the legacy of a traditional hierarchy um, that prevent them to be effective. So our decision then was to, um, instead of adding stuff, remove stuff and let the, these people operate and um, give them autonomy and uh, diffuse those, those practices, I mean, spread those practices to others as well. Um, the intention is that the more people doing or collaborating better, more effectively, we increase the speed of innovation, we increase the speed of delivery um, of benefits to patients and bring products to the market. Hmm. That's really interesting because I think what I hear you saying is you didn't necessarily go to the drawing board or just like start from scratch, start from the beginning, start from nothing. You recognized that you already had strengths in the company and in the organization. There were good people doing great things already. And so you were able to step back look at what was going on, identify those great moments, those great people, those great skills that they had, remove some barriers from them, but also learn from them and then be able to bring their great skills to a lot of other people and build everybody up together. In that way, you were able to be faster about things and you reached success a little bit quicker than just starting from from the beginning yeah and uh, you in recognize the work that people are doing right recognize mm. the, see a very important element that is the culture so once you if you bring something out of the um, blank board or a consulting model consultant model that is from outside the, the organization may have reaction to that culturally speaking but if you're enhancing a culture that already there it's just being probably is just being um, hidden because of the many many um, artifacts or structures we put in place in, on top of that we remove those things and just let the culture emerge then the culture takes care of itself um, so that's another way of saying like what you brilliant summarized you bring up such a, a great point, and I think so many people forget how important the culture is. I know I4CP has done a lot of work around um, culture, and that's a great connection point. So I know that this work has been driven by self-managed teams, which is really a, a fascinating way to go about work as it is. What are some of the core team agreements that you used and that you would recommend for other self-managed teams? Yeah, that's a very good question. So or recommendation for the even for for every self-managed team that is formed in in organization around the opportunity around um, innovation initiative is that they start by defining the shared outcome you now it sounds simple bring practice is very difficult to do and yet we know that the time invested on building or developing that shared outcomes explains 66 percent of the success we had over 600 self-managed teams formed in between summer of 2021 and uh, summer of 20 yeah summer of 2021 to summer of 2022 that's where we look into the data and having shared outcomes it's 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 a big difference 
Um, and I think you would get to that intuitively. Everyone will get it intuitively when I tell a story. I was first exposed to this concept when I was five to six years old, okay? So I used to go with my dad to his work. His job was to inspect and uh, construction sites of uh, popular houses in underdeveloped parts of Brazil. So he was there to make sure the money was going to build popular houses and not swimming pools for the, <laughs> for the <laughs> officials in the, in the city. <laughs> And I was curious usually, and, and I will approach people and ask what they were doing. And very often I would get answers like, I'm putting this brick here. And I, at five, six years old, I will ask why? And the answer is because my boss told me or because it's my job. You know, months later, I would come back to the same site and we come back regularly. And I would notice that my dad was really upset with those when we go into those visits because as you can imagine, the projects were over scheduled and over budget, right? Now, very few times I'll get an answer like, I'm building places where people are going to feel safe and protected. I'm building homes. Or we are building a place where people can sleep well. We are building bedrooms or we are building a living room. So I noticed that when I got those answers, my dad didn't get upset with the site and we didn't we wouldn't go back very often because they'll hmm. finish on time. And uh, I assume on budget, I was too young to ask about those questions, <laughs> but I noticed that pattern. So I got, oh, that's a big difference. Now I understand what it is. And we learned this from these 8% on um, of the key collaborators we, we identified through the organization. So one thing they have very clear is what is their purpose which is usually bigger than themselves. It's like usually about patients, usually about the society, but they also are able to articulate what is the impact that they want to create in the next six months, in the next year. And with that, they go around and uh, in the, try to identify people and have a similar objective, similar outcome um, and or skills and capabilities to contribute to that. And they spend the time to let surface what is the benefit that people see, what is the outcomes people, that people have that would match with that outcome that they are pursuing. And that usually leads to a stronger collaboration. And when things get tough and challenging, they actually can um, base themselves on what they're doing, why they're doing that, um, rather than just this, we receive an instruction. Usually when is I receive instruction or um, the outcome is not very strong, any first challenge, the teams uh, fall apart, the uh, people drop out, they don't want to take that, uh, contribute or participate in that activity any longer because it's not, uh, it's not a, there is not a strong objective for them. It's not a strong contribution for them. Um, so these are, fortunately, these are skills we can develop. That's this, this assumption we operate with. We, the more we spend time reflecting on our purpose and outcomes, and the more we articulate those and explain to other people and listen from other people, and it becomes clear for um, each one of us what are our outcomes and what are the things we can do um, that matches our purpose. And mm -hmm. this is where we're investing a lot. Uh, and, and this is what I would recommend any self-managed team to first thing to start by actually any matter, any team, start by having agreements about the outcomes. Working practices, rituals, um, process, they help to create some efficiency, but efficacy, the ability to deliver what is needed for customers and patients come from understanding what are the shared outcomes that the team is pursuing. Hmm. So I hear two really interesting themes in here. You're talking about shared outcomes, but I also hear you referencing purpose. Are those the same thing or are they slightly different? Uh, they're slightly different. I think usually purposes are bigger, right? So like my purpose in life is, right? I exist for, um, but these ex I'm exist for is it's going to be I hope for for many 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 years right decades. But what I'm going to do this year? What I'm going to do? What which the impact I want to see happening um, in, in society or for my customers this year align with my purpose? 
So that the this year, these next uh, six months is the outcome. What is the outcome I want to see? What's the impact I want to see? What's the change I want to see happening um, or that I want to contribute to? It's, it's more concrete um, than the purpose is it's big and, and broad. Yeah, okay. I appreciate that clarification. Another thing I heard you say was how, um, certainly how important this is. We often don't do it, but it is within our realm of um, power or control to be able to develop these skills, to figure out what that purpose is, to define those outcomes. Um, I heard you mentioning a lot of introspection, a lot of reflection, and listening to other people at the beginning of a project in order to set that up. Is there um, any tips that you have for people as they're starting to go through that process at the beginning of a project? Yeah, well, uh, I think just going through that is a, is a very important um, um, investment of time. People mm. tend to just want to jump and do the work, but spending time to articulate, I invite you, Bethany, what is your purpose, right? Understanding what's your purpose is great. I can see already if it matches my purpose and then understand what the impact you want to see happening or contributed to in the next uh, six months, one year, already we can see that what it matches. And even if there is not a hundred percent overlap, we can, by having that conversation, we can already start identifying common things we can work together. I may come to realize that, oh, I never thought about that impact. And I may reshape my intended outcome to match yours as well. So having that conversation, um, it's fantastic. We are still figuring out how to make that more structured. So we are using, mm -hmm. you know, the teams are using um, a kind of a, a guide, a, a map for that, but we are learning which things, which practices are working better and which not and how to make that more structured. So we experimenting basically. So at now starting with the conversation is the best, is the first start. And we see, it's very interesting. And now I'm probably digress a little bit from your question, but what we see is that also this, this theme is coming up more and more often where people, when people have the freedom to choose which initiatives mm -hmm. to take part, they start asking what's the impact and how I choose that impact, how it, but for that, we start seeing that they need to understand how they define their own impact or, uh, and that helps on, um, also for individuals to decide and prioritize their energy, um, which then drives to more efficacy. So we, these are all things that are emerging and we are learning as we, we remove some restrictions on how people collaborate and how people uh, choose where to invest their time and give them more autonomy to do that. Wow. I mean, you just keep going back to uh, some of the first answers, um, questions and answers that, that we talked about um, where you were highlighting, you know, energizers and tapping into energy that people can bring to projects, what you've learned from that, um, and then also this, this culture of agility, um, learning, trying, experimenting, figuring out what works, what doesn't work. So I love how I'm, I'm just learning so much about um, how the cycle just keeps like feeding itself um, for a better and better outcome, which is really, really neat. So talking about, you know, the, the purpose, the shared outcomes, um, fast forward, how do you measure success or how have you measured um, the results of building these collaborative network capabilities? Yeah. So we, it's very interesting. We measured before and after as well. Um, one, because we are we need to convince parts of the organization or parts of the stakeholders that investing in um, collaborative practice or relationship building is actually a good investment. So one, we develop experiments to do that, to demonstrate that there is a benefit. So we start by that. We need to create a certain understanding that 
it's a good investment. People need to be feel confident that at least and it's a good step to take on. There is no harm, it's not a, and it's not a, a big waste of time and energy. So one of the exercises we did was actually a colleague, colleagues of us that actually took the initiative in, in Chile was to see, to compare um, the level of um, or intensity or the degree of relationships between sales team um, with the external customer and with the internal team and compare that with the, the sales performance. And uh, of course, what comes across is that the teams that have a better relationships with the customer and have a, a good connections and relationships inside the company were more responsive to the needs of the customer, spend more time understanding the needs of the customer, therefore deliver what the customer needs and therefore they had better sales, right? It's, it sounds like obvious <laughs> when you put like that, but. Uh, when you see the comparison between these two metrics against other teams, um, you you understand the importance of that. So the, we want to create then three to five times more medical benefits to patients at half of the cost society. It's a very long-term goal. This is like our purpose, right? It's a very long-term goal. But to measure whether we're in the right direction, we are looking to how strong are the relationships that we are building, how, um, how um, effective are the behaviors or how, how much of the behaviors of good, good collaborative practice um, our colleagues are adopting. So one of the way we do that is we do, we use a lot of network analysis, organizational network analysis. We do active and passive. Um, on the passive, we collect information about the collaboration that is, is emerging around those projects or initiatives that, um, self-managed teams can, can create. And we also do active network analysis to see what's the strengths of those relationships and that those strengths based on seeking inspiration and seeking help and advice, which we know that these two types of, of relationships are very strong. So if you, if I go, if I reach out to you because you stretch my uh, perspective and you provide me help and advice, it, we're gonna have a stronger bond um, than if I'm reach out to you only to get information or an input for a task that I have to execute. So this we use a lot and we, um, and we develop some experiments um, to test whether that these metrics are, uh, are true and they are. And we use a lot of sensing, what we call sensing the environment which is you in traditional way, you have the pulse checks with the employees. We send surveys and they come back, which is a great thing to do. But what we're experimenting a lot is getting communities to, we, we, to ask questions and answers and develop the solutions by themselves. So we throw a theme outside in the community and ask them to uh, talk about this theme. And we capture all that discussion, all that conversation, and then we see the profile of questions. Are they more in inquisitive questions, more curious questions, curious questions, or are questions more oriented to doing things like how I do this, what I do that? And then we create spaces um, that foster those those profiles. If it's questions are more related to we want to get things done or we want to exchange practice and experience, we create a space where people can share those experiences. If it's more inquisitive, then people need some time off to reflect and explore the why. Why, what is that challenge? What is out there? And innovate based on those questions. So we are using these metrics. And we look, look into the interaction of between individuals when they are in the communities, when they are collaborating. Uh, and we see whether we're improving, if there are more innovation coming out, more I bad ideas, um, better results, faster delivery and on the outcomes. So that's how we are doing and experimenting as well, Bethany. I, I can never say this is gonna be the definitive solution because it may, we may realize that there are, the, there are better, better approach coming um, as we learn from these exercises. Yeah. So again, it's it's that continued theme of agility. 
I really appreciate how you take this measurement question and you start to infuse elements of experimentation in it as well. Um, I think that's a different way to look at measurement than people may consider initially. So you've got a multifaceted approach, lots of different um, data. And so I appreciate how you have approached measurement with curiosity, which is a neat, neat approach to take. Um, okay, so if you were to start from day one, doing all of this all over again, is there something that you would make sure that you would do the same? Or is there something that you would do differently? Definitely, we would still do the same creating, creating conditions for the culture, the strong points of the culture to emerge. Um, and uh, a participative, still a participative approach. I think that's very important. Um, when we are talking about the measurements, I think what's the most important about measurements is that people that are participate in the exercise, understand how they are improving or how we are, how they are evolving. It's less important, for instance, for the for some central team looking to whether in the right direction. It's more for the community to see how they can correct themselves. And this would continue doing the same. Um, what probably would do uh, differently is to be um, even more explicit about the tensions that exist in the in in our belief systems, right? So we believe, for instance, collaboration. It's something that is please statement on our way of operating is very strong or culture, but it, it brings tension. In the tension we see more often is um, autonomy and the desire to have a certain kind of a very strong alignment. So this. They're not opposed, they're not contradictory, but there is a tension by how much, how much we dial in autonomy and how much we um, put in terms of needs of alignment. And we, this would be something that we would probably, with some now that we learn, <laughs> we would make it more explicit in the beginning that uh, uh, those, those belief systems, they come with surprise and we need to be able to deal with those polarities and those trade-offs. Um, and we need to learn how to deal with that. Absolutely. I think about, you know, just some of my own experiences with, with collaborative teams and there is that tension um, and the best teams really dig into that, that tension and they're able to um, flow with it. <laughs> and experience it and experiment with it and be agile with it. Um, but again, you are connecting it back to that purpose. And just what you were talking about before, when things get a little tough, um, having a, a purpose and a shared outcome is really what gets you through those moments. So uh, again, I, I love how your answers just continue to fold into your overall process. So as we wrap this up, Tell me why. Why is all of this important? Why are we doing this? Why are these scalable, resilient networks um, important for all of us, important for Roche coming in, in 2023? Yeah, so there is the, the business um, perspective, right, which I just mentioned about um, more innovation, uh, more if, uh, bring the product fast of the solutions or the innovations faster to the market. So then patients can benefit um, faster as well, reducing uh, all that implication of um, partnerships that we can develop with the wider ecosystem um, to reduce the cost to society. I do think though, there is also another important element we are learning as we go through this journey is, is about um, the importance of relationships at, at work. Um, that is something that we, uh, it's surfacing a lot, the relevance um, of it. And uh, it, it just becoming um, a, a real reason to do this. So we reshaping rather than just the, the work exists by, by itself is the work is, 
it's an instrument to actually strengthen the bond and the cooperation and uh, form better relationships. One of the biggest um, uh, dilemmas we have, for instance, when people are starting to adopt this style is the dilemma between, well, I have um, how I know which team to join. Uh, and they originally people would think, oh, it's just based on a mechanic thing, right? You have skills and the work that has to be done require your skills. But in reality, probably majority of the decisions about which team to join is a, because of relationships. It's like, do I like working with that people? Uh, is there a space that I'm respected? Is there a space that I can contribute? Is there a space that I feel like my my whole self, I can bring it to it, to that to that space? So I think this is another reason, another why to do this. It's like when we, there are many solutions to increase um, if around, to increase efficiency, to increase efficacy, to there are many models to improve um, innovation, start to improve innovation. Um, I think collaboration, talking about collaboration, talking about uh, relationships through networks or through the network, it's another reason to think on those, those angles because um, it's where we spend 70% of your time, right? Uh, on the work. So relationships are important. If we can choose or you can learn how to develop those relationships better, um, why wouldn't we invest the time for that? Mm -hmm. Love that. Why wouldn't we invest in that? Well, Emerson, this has been amazing time with you. Thank you for um, just being so generous with your time, your experiences, your expertise. I cannot wait to hear more from you and um, officially see you in March. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bethany. It was great talking to you as well.